Uh, he did, you know, it's not like I'm a great critic or anything. You know, I'm not going to give him anything, really. But he just, you know, he gave him that. And so I read it, and I was in my bed, and I finished the last page, and it was, you know, I turned the page, and I, I just laid there, and I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do? And I laid there, and I said, what the fuck am I going to do? And it went on for about 10 minutes. And I seriously didn't know what to do. I was just like, it was one of those moments I had, I, I couldn't like turn the radio on, I turned watch you, I couldn't get up out of bed. And so I grabbed a pen and paper and I wrote Tom a letter and handwritten and mailed it in the mailbox. And this book, you guys, I, it, it's just, you know, I, it, when I say he's a, an American treasure, he's, you know, he's with us and we love him so much. And, I guess we could say we loved you more, but I don't know if that means I know how much you love all of us too, so uh, I give you guys a Mr. Tom Spanbauer. switch on and off with nothing. The doorknob smells of Windex. I've been cleaning house all week. I swing the door open and the rain is loud, big drips falling from the gutter. A gust of wind blows the rain in. The smell of rain and wet cedar boards and earth, the compost heap. Just then the port light flashes on and I blink and blink and raise my hand to block out the bright. Then the light goes on out again. Hank in his black rain gear as a mass of shiny wet inside the black rainy night. I go to speak, but suddenly, I, I go to speak, <coughs> I go to speak, but suddenly, Hank, I go to speak, but suddenly, 
Hank's hand pokes out of the darkness and into the overhead fluorescence of the kitchen light right at me. It is the hand of Tarkovsky's unraveled lift and appears as if out of another dimension. I look and look and look at the hand, then grab it, Hank's hand, and I pull him in as if Hank out there was drowning in dark water. The maroon eye. Both Hank and I laugh a little the way I hold him in. When I catch a look from Hank's eyes, I quick pull my hand out of Hank, and my hand falls down again my leg. Flutter. There's a way my body is in shock to see my beloved friend right in front of me. All that, the, all that the eleven and a half years have done to him. Hank's in shock too. Both of us just stand and stare. The door is still open. The wind banging the door against the wall. Rain blowing in. We get the whole big gestalt of each other, no details really. My eyes go right to Hank's black eyes. We say some shit like, hey buddy, or how's it going, man? In no time at all, we're front to front in a big embrace. No bicycle in between us like last time. At first, it's a proper bear hug, man to man, back slapping, no crotch. But the embrace doesn't stop. Our bodies get closer. Pretty soon we're on a full, or a full, full on frontal. New red potatoes and a shovel full of earth. After a while, we both have to admit it. We are the one holding the other up. Those kind of tears that just roll out your eyes, one endless stream without any sobbing sounds. To me, that's how it is. Hank is sobbing big sobs, his belly bouncing against mine. Fucking grinny man, Hank says. I never cried once through the whole cancer thing. Now just look at me. Hank pulls away, his hands holding on tight to my shoulders. He pushes out and raises up his chest, pulls his chin down in that bit of cleft. Pulls his shoulders down too, flexes his biceps. Fucking Hank Christian, man. Doesn't change a bit. That's when I see this right eye, how the old right eye is gone and the new glass eye has replaced it. Still real tears, not glass tears coming out of that eye. Under that eye, something ink under the skin that's yellow and dark blue. The scar that makes a dent there. His neck is thicker, his face rounder, still the efficient line of Roman nose. Hank's sweet smiling lips, rain dripping from his black baseball cap. I can't see his hair because of the hoodie and the ball cap. I can tell it's clipped short, but can't tell the color. Not yet, just for men. How the light when it shines through his hair makes his hair look purple. What I see, Hank see, where I've lived the past 12 years, the overhead bright fluorescence in the kitchen, the square wooden table in the middle of the kitchen, and the four unmatched wooden chairs, the wooden tabletop scratched and stretched, stressed with circles where I've set down pots that were too hot, globs of candle wax I've tried to scrape off, a big blue handle scent, a big blue candle scented with lavender in the middle of the table, three votive candles in a red glass, the yellowish refrigerator and matching yellowish stove, the cupboards that look like real wood with a fucked up fancy design but are made out of particle board. On the counter, my new set of glasses with red and yellow balloons. I just washed. Four new big white plates I bought after Ruth left. The ugly linoleum on the floor with yellowish squares with some kind of blue triangle in them. Above the sink, a painting Ephraim did of teepees in the snow. Then there's the smell, the Windex and lemony ammonia smell from mopping the floor. I close the door, turn the overhead light off. I light the big blue candle, then the three voters in the red glass. It's like a church in here, Hank says. There are some hooks on the wall behind you, I say, where you can hang up your things. 
Just beyond the candlelight, Hank is black in the shadows, taking off his coat, his sweatshirt, hanging up his ball cap. The candlelight on Hank's face. The, that night in Pennsylvania with Olga, when Hank danced for Billy Holiday's April in Paris. What about my boots, he asked. They're soaking wet. You're standing in the mudroom, I say. Just leave them there. I'm standing between the stove and the table, fluttering my hands. I don't know what to do with them. It's just like on East Fifth Street in here, Hank says, only a little bigger. Strange to hear Hank's voice in the rooms of my house. I put my fingers around the top of the wood of the Hank, around the top on the wood of the chair and look around at the voice of him in there. My hand flutters up and covers my pendulous tip. I've got a big old couch in front of the fireplace, I say, that's where you'll be sleeping. You need some food, I say, I got chicken soup. No thanks, Grooney Hank says, I'll be hungry later though. We'll go out and get a burger. Hank doesn't know I don't go out. I mean, not like going out used to be. And that I can't eat hamburgers. When he asked if I could pick him up at the airport, I told him that my driver's license had expired. We could go to our old hangout on Columbus Circle, Hank says. Sylvia would be glad to see us. Sylvia was dead, I say. I'm out of the dark, oh. Then, did you hear about Olga? No. Don't go in the in your hand. Hank says, fucking cancer. Fucking AIDS, I say. Porca miseria, Hank says. <coughs> I make tea and we sit on the couch. Lemon, lemon singer for Frank, camel milk for me. Our days of Budweiser's and cocktails and doobies are over. The fire, <coughs> the fire's really going. So that batch of wood for pitch. Hank floods how the fire cracks and spits. There's a couple times I have to lean down to keep the fire screen closed. The Christmas tree ain't big, maybe four foot of spruce. It's behind the couch. I bought the tree that. I bought the tree that day for two dollars. There's only one left, only one of the three trees left on the lot. The guy just wanted to give it to me. In the basement, when I opened the bar box, marked Christmas stuff. All the ornaments were from two year, or were from the two years with Ruth. The Rudolph ornament, the Cinderella ornament, the red balls, the blue balls, the green balls with snowmen on them. Ruth bought it for admirer. The smaller bell shaped lavender ones, the garlands, the tinsel, the ball Ruth made with a photo of me on it, naked to in Tai Chi that day we went to Sobiano. All that Christmas shit, all the memories. Ruth had been Ruth had been what made Christmas Christmas. I threw the whole box in the garbage. That's when I saw it. Just the big black hairy legs. Tony Escobar's fairy drag queen. The Ken doll as Christmas Angel Barbie. Her lopsided halo you can plug in. I pick up the fairy drag queen, lift up her dress. The red jock strap, the wire connector on his asshole so he can sit a proper star on the very top of the tree. <laughs> no wonder everybody hates Christmas. I can never eat man. <laughs> Two hours later, after scrambled eggs and sprouted wheat toast, Hank's in the living room on the couch, sitting close to the wall, another cup of tea, a firelight on the bruised, dented face of my friend, me all the way on the other side of the couch, with my cup, hands still fluttering, just over my left shoulder, Hank's right shoulder at eye level, the tip of the Christmas tree up his ass, the fairy drag queen pokes himself up over the couch, his flowing robe, his lopsided halo, his wings spread, his arms out, measuring the years, all that space on the couch between us. <clears throat> silences at first, just a crackling fire. Not bad silences, but Big Ben knows something's going on. Little, little Ben thinks the silences are my fault. 
and they partly are, and then at this point I'm still a pretty fucked up guy. But what's really going on, what's heavy in those silences between me and him, besides the grief of years and the hellacious suffering, is that there's something hanging and saying, the grief's so big in his heart it won't be until the next day after Hank's on his third or fourth cup of coffee that he'll finally be able to speak it. It takes us a while, that night by the fire, and finally Hank and I do relax some and we get to talk and talk. Just like in the old days, it seems, when there was an actual place in the world that existed only because we existed in a space together, Hank and me inside something under a miracle umbrella. Hell bringing Hank says, what the fuck's happened to us? Fuck me, did I say. <coughs> it's the kind of cancer usually only people with blue eyes get, Hank says. The Jewish doctor on 83rd, I said, said, you're HIV positive, so you're going to get sick, so you're going to die. You knew in New York, Hank said, why didn't you tell me? Chamomile kills, chamomile tea smells like when I used to bale hay. Tastes like bale hay, too. You were so excited about Florida and very hammered. I say, I was, it was such a downer. Why didn't you tell me, I said. We're more than five years, man, since we talked. Silence. The sense there's something hidden and missing. I feel it in my throat, my breath. I think it is my soul. I just didn't know how to do it, Hank said. High gurney, I have cancer. Outside, Christmas carolers somewhere out there sing Silent Night. And Hank's new eye is a flame, an actual fire. It takes me a moment to figure in his glass eye, the fire is a reflection. The carolers Silent Night gets louder, walks past us on Morrison, just outside the window, turns down south on, onto the street. On the corner there, the cal carolers stop and laugh and talk. The winter night in their voices, after several tries, it's another night. Oh, holy night. Hank and I sit so still. We are every Christmas we've ever lived. How long ago was that, Hank asked. What? The last time in New York, Hank said, when we stood in front of a husband's home. Going well, on 12 years, I said. Holy fuck, he says, 12 years. That poem's a part of me, I say. Just one fucking line, I say, but it rips your heart out. It's a line from a larger poem, I say. <coughs> Someday, Hank says, let's try and go back and read that poem again. Another life. Another world so far away, so impossible that Hank and I could stand together one more time at 77 St. Mark's Place. Regret, man. Fucking regret. I was in denial big time, I say. I wouldn't accept it. I wouldn't accept that HIV had anything to do with AIDS. Did you ever get your doctorate, I asked? I've just got my dissertation to finish, Hank says. They've given me an extension. I called a bunch of times, I say. Got your voice down at first. Then nothing. When did you go in the hospital, Hank says. December 1st, 96, I say. Man, in 96, I was lying in a quarantine room, Hank said. There was so much fucking radiation in the root of my food through the a slot in the door. Came up to him, I said. Through my guts up. I've never thrown up, I say. All these years, not once. Almost shit myself to death, though. I was down to like 160 pounds. Shitting man, Hank says. You think you're ever, you think you ain't ever gonna stop? I was down to 140. My asshole was so sore, I say, I couldn't hear the paper anymore. Had to shower after a shit. Gave me some honking hemorrhoids, Hank said. I 
pain, my hemorrhoid up to my homeopathic doctor who told me the cure was to drink more milk, I said. <laughs> Emily O'Connor, I said. I'll call my hemorrhoid through the <laughs>